How does making something first class give you power? By the end of this episode, you'll have a better understanding of why making things first class is the most common way to gain power in your language. My name is Eric Normand, and I help people thrive with functional programming. So there's this idea of, of making ideas first class. And um, in this episode, I thought it'd be nice to talk about uh, representing things as data as a way of making things first class. You know, we've all heard about first class functions and things, uh, but often we make stuff first class as data and we don't even think about it as such. Uh, so I was listening to a talk, um, a conference talk about Pixar and Ed Catmull uh, has been with Pixar since the very beginning. He was doing his PhD like oh in the 60s or something maybe the early 70s on 3D graphics, 3D rendering and his PhD project was to model a hand, something very difficult, it's got a lot of bones, a lot of complex shapes, a lot of muscles and flesh that has to bend with the with the model and he coded I think he was working with a partner too uh, I don't remember his name but he coded up the the thing by hand right there were no 3d modeling packages you know rendering packages he had to write everything by hand and it was just hard coded it was like this is what needs to happen when we deform this mesh, right, when we bend the, the joints, the mesh has to deform. And eventually, he recognized the patterns and the concepts and started building them into data structures that could hold the data necessary for the algorithms in it. And this, I thought, was a perfect example to illustrate why moving stuff from code into data is so powerful because now 60 years later 50 years later maybe um, we have all these data formats for uh, 3d models uh, the data structures have kind of uh, let's say stabilized uh, they've they've found sweet spots and we have, we don't think of it this way, but when you had something that was just code, back when he was writing this, it's just instructions to the computer, uh, it's very hard to work with. If you need to change the shape of the hand, because you know you got the joint length wrong or something, you have to go into the code, modify it, maybe even recompile it, and it's just, you're modifying code, right? But now, if you had to change the shape of the hand, you would just open up your editor, drag a, a visual representation of that point, that vertex in the shape, and then save it, and it would save to a file. And now, wherever you use it, will load the new thing. And you don't have to touch code. We've got multiple ways of using that data structure. We've got, you know, the two easy ones to see are that the editor is using the data structure and your rendering is using the data structure. Okay, so already we see two possible uh, types of uses for that same data. There's probably more. There are probably like shape optimizers or analyzers that will tell you things about, you know, oh, you could get rid of this triangle or maybe they could get rid of that, that triangle for you. All sorts of things like that that are added on top of this data structure. So let's talk about some characteristics of this data. One is that it's more manipulable in those multiple ways I was talking about, more manipulable than code. Two, it's serializable. Data, you can 
right out to disk. You can send it over the network. Uh, it's got some format to it. And then third, it's less powerful. It's less powerful than code. Code is Turing complete. You could do anything in his routines for drawing the hand. Anything. You could, I mean, including going into an infinite loop. But these data structures are engineered in a way that they can't do everything. Basically, all they can do is, you know, render, <laughs> render uh, some polygons or something. And that limitation is the constraints that make it powerful because all you know you're you know when i load this shape file it's going to be safe now i'm not saying that all the data formats for 3d objects are safe what i'm saying is that if they're constrained correctly they should be safe right they should be able to be uh you know avoid infinite loops and things like that um the problem is often we want to add in some like loopholes. And so we say, okay, and then you can have JavaScript here. And then you've opened the door up again to code. Uh, but data itself, totally safe, right? You can load it and uh, do, work with it without any halting problem. Um, right, so I just wanna, I, I, I feel like this is something that we kind of take for granted because you know, when we start programming, there's all these interesting data formats already available, and we, we forget that they started off as code and gradually evolved to become data. And this is one of the most common ways that we have of reifying an idea. Reifying, I have a whole episode on it. But reifying basically means making something um, into in making it real, making it a concept in that you can manipulate in your language, right? So most languages don't have a way to manipulate the code that you have. Uh, so the code, you know, you write a function and all it does is compiles the code into bytecode and you can't really get at that anymore. But most languages do have a way to take a data structure and pass it to other functions and uh, walk the data structure, all, all those things. Uh, so it is first class. You know, you could uh, potentially make a nested data structure, a nested 3D object that contains more 3D objects inside. And so that's a way of composing them up. So uh, this is why uh, data is one of those, is one of the reasons why data is a very important concept and something that we should keep in mind when we're coding like can this be is this regular enough to represent as data and will that give me the power i need instead of just having it as a function not everything can be data but much more than uh, you would you would expect at first awesome my name is eric normand if this has been one of my thoughts on functional programming, if you want to see uh, this episode or other episodes, you can find them all at lispcast.com slash podcast. I've got audio, video, and text transcripts of all the past episodes there. You'll also find links to subscribe and how to find me on social media. If you would like to discuss this or any other topic, just hit me up. You'll find my email there. You'll find Twitter. Email is probably the best thing for longer term, longer form discussions, but Twitter is nice too. Uh, I'm also trying to get into LinkedIn, so you can find that too. Uh, right. That, this has been my thought. Take care and rock on.